Are we all in, everybody? Delegates How you in. Doing? Good to see you. So we can call the session to order. Because Otherwise, I've... Kate will be forced to put you in order, and I can tell you that's not a good prospect. Do you know that David was 24 when I first knew him? And look what happened. Yeah. <laughs> you too can look this bad if you spend your life on aeroplanes flying around the world. It's, uh... You get them when they're young, and then he does all the work. Do you want to just explain a little bit what okay. Global Dignity is? So um, this session is called the Global Dignity Session. And this is a very important global value, but I think a very important One Young World value. Because it's about the right of every single human being, the right of every single human being, to live a dignified life. Now, I want to make, before we actually get in to introducing the very important people who are going to run this session, I want to make an incredibly important announcement, and I want to make sure that everybody respects and follows this. We have one of our delegate speakers, Ezra, who's going to come up on stage and speak. It is very, very important that nobody takes any pictures of her, that she is not filmed, so especially to the photographers down here. When Ezra is speaking, we do not want any images of her speaking because it can cause a whole bunch of problems for her. So please respect that. You're welcome to, to shoot everybody else over the next two days, but if you can make sure that there is no video footage, no photographs taken of Ezra, um, and uh, anybody who we see doing that will come and grab their camera. Um, so it's an, it gives me absolute enormous pleasure to introduce to you the three people who are going to be running the next session. Now, um, they are fellow YGLs of mine, and YGLs are the young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. Now, I know to you guys, you look at us and go, but you're not young. How can you be young global leaders? But to the other older people in the world, they think we're young, and then we look at you in the same way that they look, look at us. But they've created this amazing movement all about global dignity. And there are three of them with us today here. The first one is His Royal Highness Crown Prince Harkon of Norway. Um, he's a humana humanitarian and goodwill ambassador for the UN. He founded the, the Crown Prince and Princess Humanitarian Fund, which actually supports some terrific programs around the world benefiting young people. He's a young global leader, as I said, and he's also one of the creators and founders of the Global Dignity Movement. Um, I'll actually introduce all three, and then they'll come up on stage and lead the Global Dignity session. Uh, the next person um, is Professor Pekka Himmenen. He is the youngest ever qualified doctor and physician in Finland. He qualified at the age of 20 in 1994. Um, he co-authored a fantastic book about the information society and the welfare state, uh, and he's a young global leader. And then last, but by no means least, uh, is John Bryant. Um, probably one of the best ways of introducing John is that a couple of weeks ago when President Clinton uh, came to address the young global leaders, he, he walked into the room and gave John an enormous hug. So he's obviously doing and done something right. He's a, an entrepreneur and a philanthropist, he created Operation Hope, which is actually America's first non-profit uh, social investment banker, uh, banking uh, organization. And he's vice chairman of President Obama's uh, Council on uh, Financial Literacy. So it's a huge honor for us to have them here today. If you could welcome them up to the stage, please. <laughs> Now, when we were rehearsing yesterday, every time somebody jumped on stage, there was a health and safety person here who went mad. So I was delighted to see the three of them leap on. Guys, over to you. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. All right, we'll, we'll try that once more. Hello, everyone. That's better. Okay. 
Um, we are here to talk a little bit about global dignity. In uh, 2005, uh, we met with this uh, impressive group of people, kind of like you're doing now, uh, in Sarmat, Switzerland. It was the first summit of the young global leaders. Uh, and um, we started talking about all the major issues of the world. Climate, like you've been doing now, health, uh, development, poverty alleviation, security, etc. And everyone were doing great work, coming together, you know, making action plans, timetables. We had it all down. We knew what we needed to do. And we were being effective, efficient, and we were doing great work. But we weren't really talking about why. And where does all this come from? Why do we want to do something good for people that are not our relatives, that are not our friends, that maybe live far away from us in a different part of the world? Where does this come from, this energy that we want to change the world to the better, that we want to do something concrete in our own community, but we also want to do something good for other people far away from us? And, um, my friends, uh, John Bryant and Pekka and myself, we started talking about, so, so what is this? What, what is the source that all of these people uh, are uh, tapping into? Uh, if we look at the major names of history, if we look at Nelson Mandela, uh, Desmond Tutu, Mother Teresa, um, Martin Luther King Jr., what did they all have in common? They wanted to do something good for other people. They wanted to lift other people and increase other people's dignity. And dignity, we were talking about, was the core value. That was what was at the center of what, of what we were trying to do. So um, we uh, started to, to talk about that. And I told them this story uh, about Matumbangal. A few years ago, I was traveling in South Africa. And I was in a township outside of Durban. And uh, I met this girl called Matumbangal. Uh, and she was at the large, last stages of AIDS. Uh, and you could tell because uh, her energy uh, was pretty low. And you could see it in, in the skin of her face. Uh, she invited me into her home. And um, she told me her story. A while before I came there, she had attracted HIV, and she became HIV positive. Now, Martin Bungle had all the right in the world to become angry, to become bitter, to be destructive. We would all have understood that. But she made a different decision. She went out and talked to her peers. She started to organize um, groups of other people who were also HIV positive so that they could support each other because AIDS is not only a lethal disease because they didn't have access to drugs in this area but it's also attached to stigma and discrimination so it's a, it's a double burden so she organized that so that they could support each other and in addition, she did something that was very courageous. She did meetings, large meetings, to talk to her constituencies, to others from the village and from the neighboring villages, to talk about how they could avoid becoming HIV positive. Now, Martin Bungle became sort of a leadership model for me uh, because she was able to do all that. And I was thinking, if she's able to do all this magnificent work and inspire so many people to do, you know, to make the right decisions and create a better life for themselves, what can't we then do? What can't I then do with all the resources that we and I have at our disposal? And so I told this story to uh, Peck and John, and we started um, talking about how we could tap into the source of dignity. So we started going, um, we, we started um, thinking about how we could talk to children, kids, youth about dignity. And we went into schools 
and we started doing dignity days. And we asked kids, you know, what are you for? What do you want to do the next year to increase someone else's dignity? Now, so if you had a piece of paper, um, bring it up and write down what you're for. It's not allowed to be against, you have to be for something, it has to be one thing. And also write down what you want to do the next year to increase someone else's dignity. And that should be concrete and actionable. Now it's okay if you change the goal and you change what you want to do the next year. That's okay, but it's important to have something that you've defined as your goal, because without a goal, it's hard to score. So you can hang it up you know, um, above your bed so that every morning when you wake up, you can look at it. Uh, you can put it on your desk. Um, but that's, that's one of the things. And the other thing is uh, to tell dignity stories. Uh, so we ask the kids to uh, tell stories about how um, someone has lifted someone else, someone has strengthened uh, someone else's dignity. So um, basically, we've done this now through the uh, network of the YGLs. We've done this in more than 30 countries. So I thought I'd show you a little film before I leave the floor to Pekka. One important message that uh, we have about dignity is that uh, we don't want to only talk about dignity. We want to see dignity in action. Today is the Day of Dignity. International dignitaries, Norwegian royalty and young global leaders from the World Economic Forum descended on a small school in Grassy Park just outside Cape Town, all this in aid of the Dignity Day in South Africa. Their aim to help equip South African youth with the skills in dignity and financial literacy. Hello, hello to everyone. Uh, uh, I'm really impressed by everything that you are doing for creating a more dignified world. Um, I have uh, myself been working very hard for advancing a more dignified world from poverty elimination to climate change issues. But one thing I find very important is that we need to have inspiring examples uh, uh, of persons uh, uh, inspiring uh, us uh, about dignity and one such person that I have had an opportunity to, 
work with uh, is uh, the president of Finland, uh, who is the first female president uh, in our country. And uh, I had a chance to work uh, a little bit for global social justice uh, with her. But uh, she has also become a very big uh, role model for all young women and girls in Finland who now think that they can become anything they want. Uh, she once mentioned to me that she gets all the time letters for, from small girls uh, saying that uh, she's inspiration. But then she mentioned once that uh, she's now starting to get letters also from small boys uh, writing worried that can men still also become president uh, uh, in Finland? Uh, and I've asked from people in different countries that what do you actually, what are they actually taught when they are young by their mothers? Uh, in the U.S., the most common answer I've received it has been that mothers tell to their children that you are great, you can become the next president of the United States. Then. Uh, I was once in Italy and uh, asked the same question because I, I think that the Italians look very self-confident and extrovert, that perhaps their mothers also teach to them that you are great, you can become anything, to which my colleagues answer that this is not actually the case. In Italy, the mothers don't teach you are great, but the mothers say to their children, uh, you are stupid, but don't worry, I'll take care of you. <laughs> uh, uh, in, in, in a way, it's uh, quite unlikely that I am here because uh, my own grandmother uh, was a cleaning lady. Uh, she didn't get any education. She was born in very poor conditions. Actually, of the eight children of the family, three didn't survive even through the childhood. And she had to leave at the age of 16 from home to work uh, as a servant and uh, uh, she worked as a cleaning lady for the rest of her life. And I remember one story that she told about dignity that meant very much to her. Uh, uh, once she was doing two jobs at the same time, one was at the construction site and the other was uh, the government's uh, uh, building. And one night, late evening, she was cleaning the Prime Minister's office. When the Prime Minister came back to his office, and she was very nervous, because she thought in, in her own words that uh, I'm just a cleaning lady and this, this is the political leader of the whole country. But what the Prime Minister said to her left a lasting impression. The Prime Minister said to my grandmother that I'm sorry to interrupt your work like this, it's people like you who put their whole heart to their work and family that have created our country what it is. And uh, even if they were simple words, this uh, uh, had a big impact uh, on my grandmother because it answered to her very basic human dream, which we all have in common, which is that we all have this dream that I have a dream that my dignity uh, will become recognized. And if it becomes recognized, uh, uh, surprising, amazing things can start happening. I call it the power of dignity, and for me, it literally changes my attitude towards every person, because if I see a cleaning lady or a cashier, I realize that this person could literally be my own grandmother, and it changes my behavior towards that person. So basically my grandmother taught me three things that you must value yourself, you must value others, and, and you must work for some bigger values than yourself. And that's what I've been passionate about, and I, I think it's important for people to remind themselves that what am I about, what am I for, what is really my meaningful thing in life that I want to be about. And it was mentioned by David, by, who, by the way, uh, uh, deserves really great congratulations for putting this One Young World uh, uh, meeting together, uh, that uh, 
I did my PhD in philosophy very early, at the age of 20. And I entered the university when I was 18. And sometimes I'm still asked that how is it even theoretically possible to do your PhD in two years? And when I'm tired of answering this question anymore, sometimes I just say, uh, that, well, it's simple. You just have to finish your master's thesis the first year and the PhD on the second year. <laughs> but uh, if I'm more serious, I had a, a unique, <laughs> un unique, un unique opportunity of being in, a, in an environment of dignity and to see actually the power of dignity. My own teacher was, was a, a famous philosopher, Jori Henrik von Wricht, who actually was a professor in Cambridge, uh, 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 successor of Wittgenstein, who is known as uh, one of the biggest names in philosophy uh, in the last uh, century. And uh, uh, when, when I entered the university, then soon I started to get passionate about writing a thesis related to Wittgenstein and Russell. And then with the a kind of bold attitude of an 18-year-old first-year student, I thought that, uh, well, because it seems that this not then almost 80-year-old Jori Henrik von Bricht and me, the 18-year-old first-year student, have the same interest topics. Uh, it's good for the colleagues to get introduced. And I went to his room to tell that uh, soon uh, there are uh, breakthroughs to be expected in this field of study. And I can tell that the 80-year-old uh, uh, Jori Henrik von Bricht uh, looked pretty surprised <laughs> that uh, what can I still learn from this uh, first year student. But what, what he actually he conveyed as a message is that I want to help you to be at your best in your own thing. I, I want to uh, dignify you in your thing. And there is one letter in my life that has been uh, perhaps one of the most meaningful ones. And it was from Jori Henrik von Brick just before he died. Uh, and I think he wrote it uh, uh, not only to me, but to all of us to remind us what we have to remember about us right now. Because uh, you are young now, you have passion, you have the values, but you have to keep, it, keep those uh, in your mind very clear all the time so that you don't uh, lose them. And uh, this is the letter he uh, wrote uh, just before he died, very conscious that soon his time was ending. Uh, he had uh, had energy to watch some interview that he refers to. But he writes to me, but r really this is a message to all of us. Dear Pekka, yesterday I saw a TV interview of you. It impressed me deeply. I hope that your heart will always remain as pure, your mind as open, and your thought as clear as what the interview conveyed. If you ever want to pop into my office to ask or discuss anything, you are always welcome. Last semester, however, because of my illness, I was rarely able to come there anymore. I wish you a happy new year and all the best for the rest of your life, Jori Henrik von Bricht. I don't know what more a teacher or a, a person can give to another person a message of dignity and reminding what is, imp what is it really important to remember. So what will you use your creativity for? What will you serve? And I'll end with uh, a, a, an encounter that left me with this question because together with Hakon and John we were in Vienna some time ago and then we talked with 12 year old kids uh, and then one 12 year old girl said that she also has an example of what dignity means and then she told a powerful even moving example she said that two years earlier when her own grandmother had been dying she had uh, uh, sat on, the, on her bedside with her mother, held her hand and chatted with her for the last days of her life. 
And if you think of that image of a 10-year-old girl sitting next to her dying grandmother, and some of the last words that the gr granny hears in her own whole life are her grandchild's words, uh, I love you, granny. It's very difficult to imagine a more powerful image of what dignity means. And what I thought then was that if this 10-year-old girl could show such dignity, what kind of dignity do we show to this 12-year or 10-year-old girl, or other children in general, or other people in the world in general? Because even if we are, uh, well, maybe we are not, but you are uh, young, uh, uh, we are creating some lasting inheritance through our actions. And I leave you with uh, the, the question that how are you going to act? Two lines to think about. Not caring about the environment or poverty is like stealing from our own children. And also, we don't inherit nature from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. Please work for a more dignified world. Thank you. Good morning. You know, <clears throat> the Bible suggests be hot or be cold, but if you're lukewarm, I'll spat you out. Translation, even God does not like mediocrity. I try to live my life one to 10, or eight to 10. One to five is mediocrity. Five to seven is entertainment. Ladies, that's the guy you date, but you don't marry. <laughs> eight to 10 is excellence. Not black excellence, or brown excellence, or tan excellence, or white excellence, or Asian excellence, or Latino excellence. It's just excellence. You cannot take a break from greatness. You want to do this work. You're a bit of social entrepreneurs. But you got to remember that an entrepreneur works 18 hours a day to keep from getting a job. The success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. It's about how you handle hard times. How do you respond in challenges? Life is 10% what life does to you and 90% how you choose to respond to it. What's your response going to be? I know two people who respond under pressure with class and substance and style and with a giving heart. The coolest philosopher on the planet reads a book a day. Reads a book a day. <laughs> I'll repeat that, reads a book a day. I said, man, how do you read a book a day? He said, I'm a philosopher, it's my job. <laughs> Pekka Himanen, the coolest prince on the planet, the people's prince. <clears throat> I call him the James Bond of royalty. All about giving. We were out waiting to come inside, and we were getting some water, and you know, whenever the crown prince is around, you know, because there's like 20 other security people with him. I know them all by name. And, it's, and he's got an aide and an attache, and we wanted some water. So who gets the water? Crown prince gets the water. He then passes it to me, then passes it to Becca. Subtle, but important. Subtle, but important. I want to acknowledge David for his leadership and his vision here today, no good deed shall go unpunished. Give him some love for what he has brought together with this idea, this vision. <laughs> what you do, who you are, doesn't start tomorrow. It's not about some leader uh, in some foreign land. It's not about a politician. Nelson Mandela said when he became president of South Africa, Madiba, uh, they call him in South Africa. He said to my mentor and my hero, Ambassador Andrew Young, who was Dr. King's most senior aide in the civil rights movement, he said to, Andrew Young said to Madiba, to Nelson Mandela, when he became president, what are you going to do for poor people? 
And Mandela said, what are you going to make me do? And Ambassador Young was confused. You, you're, you're Nelson Mandela. You're, you're Madiba. You, you continue the, the work of Dr. King. He said, be clear. I was a civil rights leader. I was with some of the people who had been oppressed. But now I'm president of a country for all people, one world. What are you going to make me do? What are you going to make your presidents do? What are you going to make your mayors do? What are you going to make your senators do? More importantly, what are you going to do? Leadership starts very small. Dignity begins like a plant. I was in, I grew up in Compton, California. I grew up in South Central uh, Los Angeles next to Watts. And I remember my next door neighbor, uh, his, his name was Tweet. And Tweet was a little social emotional terrorist. 97 pounds wet, but everybody was afraid of Tweet. You remember that, you know, everybody knows the, the look. Yo, 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 what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? Not you. Anyway, Tweet terrorized the neighborhood and everybody was afraid of Tweet. And my mother luckily told me she loved me every day of my life, so nothing more powerful than a child being told that he or she is loved. My best friend, George, a student, not so different from you, 18 years old. George didn't know who he was. He didn't have a mother and a father who told him that he was somebody. So George decided he wanted to look like Tweet. So then he started acting like Tweet. Then he started walking like Tweet. Then he started hanging out with people like Tweet. And George got shot just like Tweet. George is dead. He's been dead for a long time, but he's alive in my heart. George's story in this world is over, but he remains, it remains an inspiration for me in the next. My story was different. My mother told me I was somebody. And I remember I used to, I used to go to school dreaming about ideas. Muhammad Yunus told you about the power of ideas. And I remember a guy came to my classroom, and this is Compton now, so be clear, as in Compton, and a guy came to my classroom, a banker, to do a class in financial literacy. He had a blue suit on, a white shirt, and a red tie. He happened to be Caucasian. It didn't matter. It wasn't about, he wasn't white, black, red, brown, or yellow. He was green, the color of U.S. currency. And, <laughs> and I just had one question for him. I said, how did you get rich legally? <laughs> Man, I want to be like you. How did you do that? And, and I, I started becoming obsessed with suits. I'd never seen anybody with a suit on before. And then I started noticing, you know, when you buy a bicycle, you start seeing bicycles everywhere. Ladies, you buy those nice pair of new pumps, and you start seeing those pumps everywhere, which you don't like. But in, you, you start seeing what you orient around. So I started seeing suits everywhere. That's something I noticed my dad wore a suit to church. Then he wore a suit on to Bible study on Tuesday, and he wore a suit on Friday to make payroll for the business that he ran, and, and I wanted to wear a suit, so I started, you know, wanting a suit. My mother made, put me in these suits that she made, these three-piece crushed velvet, <laughs> purple <laughs> suit with a ruffled shirt and a big, 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 big bow tie. Traumatized. My mother sent me to school dressed like this every single day in Compton. <laughs> no, you didn't get that. Anybody here knows where Compton, like, you know what I'm talking about? This is, this, is, this is nothing nice. I got my rear end whipped every single day. Kids said, the guy, you're dressed like this, you must have some money. But when you open the lapel of the suit, it said designed by Nita. And my mother's name is one Nita Smith. She made these ugly suits. I couldn't understand why would my mother do this to me, but she realized there are three types of people like three types of birds. I'm going to get to this in a moment. There are eagles, there are buzzards, and there are turkeys. She said, you're going to be an eagle, and the only gang you enjoy is mine. So I started walking like a businessman, talking like a businessman. I wanted a briefcase, uh, and there was nothing in it, but I wanted a briefcase like a, a businessman, and then I wanted to sell something. So I started selling candy through the den of my house. I hate candy to this day. I ate through half the inventory, and I 
made $300 a week, then I found girls and lost the business of another story, but <laughs> recurring theme of my life. And at 10 years of age, I lived my dream. I was a businessman. And fast forward, homeless for six months of my life when I was 18 for believing too much in my own press. Whatever goes around, comes around. Regain my life because God don't make dirt. You can't fall from the floor. You can make a mistake and not be a mistake. A saint is a sinner that got up. Reconstituted my life, grew a business of $24 million a year of business, but I realized that money wasn't everything. I was about what I wanted to give, not what I wanted to get. As Hawking has already said, you got to figure out what you're for in a world that's obsessed with what they're against. Started Operation Hope after the riots in 1992. Everybody said, I was 26 years old, everybody said it would never work. They wrote me off. It's a beautiful thing to be written off. Every one of you is going to be discounted and written off. Count on it. Hope for it. Pray about it. Because it leaves you alone. They said this kid can't do anything. The kid had been in business for 16 years, but they didn't know that by the time I was 26. So a dream now has served 1.2 million people. It's raised a half a billion dollars, and my mission is to make free enterprise and capitalism actually work for the poor, to empower people with a hand up and not just a hand out. I thought I knew something, and then a young man came in my office, uh, Hawking. He came in my office, Pekka. He had a dream. He wanted to be a clothier, but nobody would listen to him. When we were in the hall and you gave me the water, that you were giving me dignity. When I was talking to the waiter at the restaurant and looked him straight in his eye and said, how are you today? We were giving each other acknowledgement and dignity. How many times do you see somebody and never see him? So he came in my office and I saw him and he had a dream. He was 27. Make a long story short, he, 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 we gave him a small loan for $35,000, gave him financial literacy training, some attention. $35,000 loan, he's now doing $800,000 $800, a year in revenue, has six employees, paying his taxes, raising his children, has started his own nonprofit to teach young people entrepreneurship. He made the suit I'm wearing today. Is this pimping or what? A young man wearing a suit in South Central ended up with a young man making suits in Beverly Hills. I thought I knew something. And this is the message for you because I, don't, I never want you to think you're too smart or that you, you got it all figured out. When you go far enough to the North Pole, you end up south. I went to India and I went to go teach at a school about dignity. And I came back to the hotel and I had left my wallet in the, the car. And so I called the the school, I said, you, I need you to bring the car back. I've left my wallet in the car. Said, Sir, that was not our car. That was a taxi. We don't know where your wallet is. You should not have high hopes. This was in D Delhi. So they called at 10 o'clock, no, no response. 11 o'clock, no response. 12 o'clock, no response. I went to sleep. 1 o'clock, they called me, no response. 2 o'clock, they called and said, the taxi driver picked up his cell phone and has returned the call. He's coming to your hotel. Don't have high hopes. We don't know what's in your wallet. He got to my hotel room, and an interpreter was there. And through the interpreter, uh, he was telling me what was going on. He passed me my wallet, and I looked in it. There was my passport. There was my money. There were all my credit cards. Not one thing had been touched. Let me put this into context for you. That taxi driver made 2,500 rupees a month. Those of you from India know that's about $70 US. That's about what you spend for lunch today. $70 is what he makes in a month. So I reached in my pocket for some money. It's an instinctive thing, you know. Reach, I, I wanna sh I'm, I'm feeling bad. I want to show some support, some help. I, it happened to be $70, and he wouldn't take it. I said, there's got to be something wrong with the translation. <laughs> Tell my brother. I'm getting down with it now. Tell my brother this is, this is a month's pay. He pushed my hand back. He wouldn't take it. I said, what's wrong? He got angry with me, and he said to the translator, I did not bring you your wallet because I wanted a reward. I brought you your wallet because it's your wallet. What would have happened if I had lost that wallet in a taxi in New York City? <laughs> the richest country in the world. What would have happened if I had lost that wallet in a taxi in London? What would have happened if I had lost that wallet in a taxi in Finland? In almost any place else. So I, I, I became confused. I didn't know I was uncomfortable in my own skin now. What do I do? How do I say thank you? I said, how do I say thank you? He said, the next time you're in India, 
Come and have tea with me. Be my friend. I carried his note around with me for a year. When I came back to India, I called him. We had tea. We are friends. You know, that man gave me more than my wallet. He gave me understanding. He gave me dignity. And I'm tearing up when I tell this story. And I tear up every time I tell this story. And I want you to never forget the feeling that you had the first, sometime, sometime, the first time somebody believed in you. When I was with the Crown Prince, he told that story about the lady in India. He teared up because it was in him. It was personal to him. Never lose your passion. I'll leave you with this message. There's a difference between being broke and being poor. To be broke is economic, but to be poor is a disabling frame of mind and a depressed condition of your spirit, and you must vow never, ever, ever to be poor again. You can have a lot of money and be poor. You can have no money at all and be rich. So I asked you a question earlier today. I said, in my from top of my remarks, my mother said there are three types of birds, like three types of people. There are eagles and buzzards and turkeys. Eagles are high altitude birds. They're not arrogant, they're not pumped up, but there's a, there's a regalness, there's a dignity about eagles, sort of like you. And eagles are, has a strange way of raising children. The nest is made of sharp little twigs, message. If you get big, you get big enough when you're pushing up against the inside of that nest, you need to get up and go get a job. You cannot be 45 years old living with your mother. <laughs> but buzzards are low altitude birds. Buzzards love packs. Buzzards are always stepping on your head to elevate themselves. Always player hating, never player congratulating. Always have something negative to say about somebody. <laughs> What's he doing up there? Why is he hesitant? What, is what they're against, not what they're for. But the worst kind of bird, the worst kind of bird is a turkey. Because a turkey's got wings and can't even fly. All they do is profile. Translation, trying to be something they are. So here's my question to you. Because when you're going to do, go do this work, when you're going to go become a leader, it's not going to be a popularity contest. You've got to want to be respected and maybe not liked, then to be liked and maybe not respected. You're going to have to do things that may not be popular. You're going to have to take the road less traveled. And it has to be OK. You've got to understand that rainbows follow storms. You cannot have a rainbow without a storm first. So what kind of bird do you want to be? I said that intentionally low so that you would not instinctively respond. You shouldn't need motivation. But I'm going to amp it up. What kind of bird do you want to be? I'm from the black church. I'm talking to you. I'm gonna say, if you want me to sit down, you better answer me. I'm going to say it one last time. Say it like you mean it. If you want one world, you're going to have to stand for it and shout at your lungs. Be passionate about something. What kind of bird do you want to be? Eagle. That's what I'm talking about. All right, um, <clears throat> we're going to ask you now to contribute with your dignity stories, with um, stories about your experiences, how you have experienced either other people lifting you up, up observing someone, uh, doing something good and increasing someone else's dignity, uh, or something you've done for other people. So we would like to invite you to the mics. There's several around the room. Uh, there's one on stage to start it off. Yep, come on. Kenya. Here. Here's the mic. Here we go. I don't know if this works. How did you ace? <laughs> hey, John, my man. You're my man. You know that? You're inspirational. <laughs> my name is Jessica Colasso from Nairobi, 
Kenya. <laughs> yes, Nairobi, Kenya. <laughs> and I'm proud to say Thank I'm you, a brother. dignified person ever since I was born because I know it. You know why I know it? Because self-respect, no one can take that away from you. That's right. Right, That's guys? Right. <laughs> right. Now, they asked, where is the energy coming from? You know where that energy is going to come from? You. Mm. Let, me, let me go, Desmond Tutu style. You, 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 <laughs> you, me. Oh, man, come on. I'm a dignified person. When I grew up, my parents always had self-respect for each other. And one of the five principles of the founders of Global Dignity, the fifth principle, your dignity is interdependent on each other's dignity. So it depends in your culture. I grew up in a, in, in a family that have, we have high respect for each other. My mom has really inspired me to be where I am, my, my, my entire family, but mainly my mom, she's really inspired me, and I am a dignified person. And ever since I was growing up, my motto was to make the world a better place, empowering people around me. So I am here to empower you. Each and every one of you is a dignified person. You have self-respect for yourself, and remember, no one can take that away from you. Hey, let me flaunt a bit. I'm a TED Global Fellow. I'm one of the top 40 women under 40 in Kenya. I'm one of the top women coders in Kenya. But I don't flaunt about this. I'm a down-to-earth person. And that's what, what di dignity is all about, being down-to-earth, respecting each other. Yeah? I work at Strathmore University, one of the leading private universities in Kenya. And everyone there is a dignified person. From the person, the watchman, to the person cleaning, to the vice chancellor. You can't even tell when the vice chancellor is coming to the university because we're all at par with each other. I work with a lot of young students at Strathmore University. And it distresses me when they're doing their final year projects. I don't like to see them all stressed up because they have low self-esteem. So I go to them. I go to them as a research scientist. I mean, I have a lot of other work, but because of my, my love and compassion for helping others, I go to them and ask them, is there something I can help you out with? It's all about helping people, changing the world. Now, I'd like to tell you a story. A story about Ushaidi. Ushaidi means witness in Kiswahili during the post-election violence in Kenya. That was the darkest time in Kenya, January 2008, when we had our elections. Things didn't go the right way. I knew you for years, and I would just kill you. Everybody lost respect for each other. They didn't even respect themselves. They were killing people, literally killing people. Over 600 people were displaced. Can you imagine? I mean, every, everybody's morale was lost. Now, not all was lost, because a group of young developers, people like you, me, you and me out there came together and developed a platform, a web mashup called Ushaidi, whereby people from all over Kenya if you had witnessed a violent act, you were able to send this via mobile, via SMS, I mean, via, uh, via email and all. So you, people in Kenya could actually see what was going on around. Even if you were not in the midst of the violence, you could actually see what your brother, your sister, your friend was doing to each other. I mean, killing you right there, having no dis disregard for even if I've known you for years. Man, that was not good. So this group of people came together, put up this platform to alert people out there. Hey, stop doing this, man. 
Where is your self-dignity? Where is the, the dignity for other people? We need to stop doing this and raise our dignity, self-dignity, and raise the dignity of other people. So this actually made people aware, and people within Nairobi and all parts of Kenya started mobilizing themselves. They started going out there, helping the people. Right there, that's a true story in Kenya. <laughs> Do you know what Ushaidi has done to date? How many people know about Ushaidi with a raise of the hands? Ushaidi has been in BBC, it's been in Forbes, it's been in CNN. You have to know about Ushaidi, man. It's a product developed, made in Africa, adopted globally, changing the way people think about Africa because we are dignified people and we have a stand in the world. People need to hear us. Ushaidi is currently being used in the Haiti earthquake to mobilize people around the world, sensitize them on increasing the self-respect for people in Haiti, helping everyone around us. So I'd like to end by saying, if you have a dream, you can achieve it. And I'd like to ask you to say, yes, we can. And by the way, John, I'm an eagle. I knew it before I was born. My mom knew it before I was born. My mom and dad knew it as born. I'm a Leo, by the way, but I'm an eagle. Uh. Kenya flying high. You know what? I think Kenya's going to be okay. 